higher gossip is the kind of conversation that is at once titillating and illuminating. I was born in 1929 in Berlin. Uh, my family was Jewish. My father was a great believer. Who, he was a medical man, a physician, but uh, he was a great believer in philosophy. In fact, he took private philosophy lessons from the head of the German Kant Gesellschaft, the organization that occupied itself in a business-like way with Kant. And then on Sundays, he and I would go off in the neighbor, to the neighboring park, and he'd take my hand and tell me what he'd learned about Kant. So I spent my childhood uh, partly being trained in <laughs> philosophy. In '33 came the Nazis. I walked to school a couple of miles, I guess. It was a very good uh, Jewish private school. And on the way, uh, uh, Nazi kids would run after us, throw things. There were, in the last year, almost nightly air attacks from British bombers. And uh, we weren't allowed into the public shelters, so we went in the root, to the root cellar of our own home. By 1939, my father was in America looking for a position. And uh, eventually, in '41. My brother and my mother and I came over, and I went to school in Brooklyn. I went to Bay Ridge High School for girls, and I was, I think, a rebellious and possibly unbearable kid. I had a best friend. Her name was Mary Wetschzachowski. She and I were thick, and we made the world unsafe for teenagers. Mother was absolutely horrified when she first met Mary. But Mary rang my bell to pick me up for one of those depredations that we were engaged in. And there she was with a beanie that had a propeller on top. My mother was not happy. <laughs> I went to Brooklyn College. Here I am at a school which is all required. I hated requirements in Brooklyn. There was Classics 101 required. I didn't want to be there, so I didn't read my assignment the way students do. So a test came. I, I was used to getting A's, straight A's. <laughs> I flunked. And uh, that uh, ignoble fact drove me to pick up my text and actually read the homer I was assigned. And that did it for me. By that time, I had thoroughly fallen in love with Homer, and I decided to do classics, which was a great disappointment to my father because his, his ardent wish was for me to become a medical doctor and to join him in the practice, maybe doing the uh, children. And I, I liked that idea very much, you know, dealing with babies, but almost spoiled it all. <laughs> Yale was not a place I was particularly happy at. I had good teachers, but uh, I didn't uh, find classics, uh, professional classics, very interesting. I wasn't very I wasn't a very good student either, but um, then I had the luck to receive a fellowship to go to Athens, uh, to the American School of Classical Studies. Before long, someone picked up that I might be a good worker in, in the excavations, not outside, uh, not outside because I developed an absolutely devastating talent for sweeping away uh, two millennia with my shovel, so I was not a good digger. But inside, where the stuff is studied, and I was taking around the work rooms, huge tables full of shirts, 
And I was asked which of these things I'd like to publish, which was a great honor. And I didn't know one f f table from the other. And I came to a table which seemed to me full of sort of uh, humorous and merry paintings. And I pointed to it and I said, that's what I want. Archaeologists tend to be absolute zealots. It was a lovely characteristic. They focused on nothing but the stuff they dug up. For instance, coming down from the American School of Classical Studies, where we all lived, to the excavations where I worked, the excavations of the Athenian marketplace, we were all peering in sewers or in ditches to say, see if there were any antiquities sticking out. That was the tea time conversation. What was not welcome were what one might call meditative questions. But they began to come to the fore. For example, we all got very good at describing artifacts in anthropomorphic terms. Take a, an amphora, which is a Greek wine jar. It had handles, that is to say arms, it was said to have a neck, it had a foot, it had a belly. It was treated as if it were an organic being and described in that way. I began to wonder what makes it possible to take an artifact and transmogrify it into a human being. Uh, we refer continually to good proportions, bad proportions. I didn't know what a proportion was until I came to St. John's, and then I discovered that. So. I became absorbed in questions that arose in archaeology but weren't discussable among archaeologists because they were thought of as diversions from uh, observing carefully. And then, of course, that question itself, what the difference is between observation or empiricism and, on the one hand, and philosophy or ontology on the other became very present to me, and St. John's was exactly the place to uh, find the text to that bear on that. We were all put on buses and we traveled all over Greece. We wandered up and down mountains, old theaters, you name it. One of my fellow travelers, whom I usually sat beside, was Seth Benedetti. I think we became friends because I was the best of the worst, so to speak. In other words, <laughs> he despised everybody, but he maybe despised me a and less. We were always uh, spent a lot of time on the bus traveling to different sites in Greece, and uh, there were maybe 15, 20 of us. He had a, a little book, a black book, and every person on the bus had a heading that was an animal. And every time that person behaved like that animal, he would make a comment. <laughs> Once he showed me the book, he wouldn't let me see my page, so I don't know what animal it was. He was superlatively brilliant. I mean, it's hard to explain how learned he was and what a memory he had. We would come to a little Greek theater in the mountains these things were magical. You know, the theaters were often well preserved. They were built into the mountain. And he would stand in the orchestra, which is the place that has the best resonance. And he would deliver choruses from Greek tragedy. Uh, not only that, he'd gone to Stuyvesant High School in Brooklyn, which was, he was from Brooklyn too, um, which was a technical school. And when the bus broke down, which was not infrequent. He was the one who got out and f got the wheel off and the tire fixed or looked under the hood and discovered it. He just knew things. It was remarkable. He had an appointment to St. John's. Um, that didn't work out because he was not student friendly. For example, he would sit at our octagonal table in the basement of McDowell, and he would read aloud a freshman student's essay, which, if done in the right tone of voice, can be hilarious. 
<laughs> but it isn't what a tutor is supposed to be doing. So in a friendly agreement between him and the dean and Mr. Klein, it was agreed that this wasn't the place for him. And he was asked if he knew somebody who might be more student friendly. And he named me and then wrote me a congratulatory postcard when I'd been appointed saying that he had meant to be, uh, he meant to be malignant, but uh, it didn't work that way. Was he a friend of man? Not really. <laughs> but I think what it was, was that he was a student of Leo Strauss's. He was so under the influence of the grandeur of the ancients and of the diminishing of that in modernity, and especially in himself, that I think what came over as arrogance was really a kind of self-despising that came from maybe not overestimating, but taking too personally the greatness of the great. I came for in my interview, Mr. Klein was the dean, and it was love at first sight. In those days, the dean's office was in McDowell, and I was in Mr. Klein's office, and he put me in a chair, and he sort of danced around me, waving in his two fingers, as if to show utter disgust, a publication of some pottery that I had sent, because that's what you do when you're applying for a job, you send a publication. <laughs> he didn't think this was worth much. And uh, by the end of the day, he took me home to his house and his wife Dodo, who was an absolutely brilliant cook, had cooked and we ate and it was wonderful. I was put up, I think, in Campbell and during the middle of the night, there was a madrigal singing group. I was absolutely enchanted. I opened my closet door to put some clothes in. There was at the bottom of the closet a skeleton with the Greek legend, know thee how turn, know thyself. I knew I was in the right place. So I got appointed and uh, uh, thanks to Benedetta really. Yosha was, uh, there was nothing frail about him. He was lusty. He loved to eat, drink. He, he was a man to imitate. He was continuously imitated. The students would build snowmen and make them look like Yosha. This was a habit he had. He had all sorts of cookinesses about him. He didn't like touching doorknobs. So he'd get out his rather dirty handkerchief and wrap it around the doorknob before you open it. <laughs> I don't know what good that was supposed to do, but that's what he did. Everybody saw this, knew it, you know, everybody imitated it. He was known for the fact that he spit. He, he would spit into the world because he, uh, he smoked a pipe a most absolutely disgusting brand called Balkan Sobranje. Hurt your nose just to breathe it in. And it made him spit, it was disgusting. <laughs> Mr. Klein, I want to give you my key. Uh oh what do you want me to do with it? It's the key to my room. I won't be needing it anymore. I'm leaving school. Really? Perhaps you are. What makes you think that? Well, I just don't seem to be getting any place here. That's interesting. Sit down. There's no point in talking about it. Sit down anyway. Please sit down. You just said uh, you don't get anywhere. Where did you expect to get? Well, when I first came here, I thought there was something I could learn. When he was dean, the students loved him. They loved him partly because of these crazinesses, but that's not enough reason to love somebody, partly because he's so absolutely unbudgeably humane about things. There was nothing official about him. He could be very dignified, he could be very strict, but he was always more human being than official.
Yesha would stand at the bottom of the stairs at McDowell and observe students' faces as they came out of class to see whether they looked engaged, happy, miserable, bored. And I remember once I came down the stairs and he pulled me into the office and he gave me hell. Why? Because evidently I'd said to a student who'd come to complain, I'd threatened the student with bodily harm if he didn't learn his irregular Greek verbs, verbs better. He just said he mustn't, don't threaten people with bodily harm. Okay. I, I tried to get him to tell me something. He wouldn't tell me anything. He wouldn't. It wasn't, it wasn't in him to collect. Pe people collected around him because he had, had a certain charm and, uh, and because they liked him. But he wouldn't pontificate for me. He wouldn't pontificate for anybody. In the end, I never knew whether it was a pedagogical hesitation or whether he just didn't know. In either case, the effect was the same. I had to do it myself. He was, to my mind, the way a seminar leader ought to be, which is that he heard what everyone said. Sometimes he paraphrased it. He made it sound more interesting than it really was. That made people be more interesting than they would otherwise have been. And that he, he was in that way really a teacher for me. He discovered the educational benefits of conversation, partly from his study of Plato yeah, and uh, 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 dialogues. Yeah. And he, he thought that his own dissertation, he would he never let me see it. He said it isn't worth the paper it's written on. Uh, he thought that most articles, the secondary literature that make up academic writing, was a pure waste of time. He didn't want to have anything to do with that. So he thought of his own book as being one of those contributions, but it was clearly more than that. I had read Klein's book because um, Seth sent it to me. I came to translate the book because I hadn't understood it properly or didn't think I understood it much at all. And I find that rousingly annoying. So I did uh, sit down to try to translate it. The other thing was that it wasn't, it's, I could tell that it was a very significant book, you know, a book dealing with the foundations of modernity. Yasha's response when I presented him with the uh, accomplished fact of the translation was first <laughs> that he didn't want anything to do with it. Yeah. Though I have to say, once it had happened, he became very interested in getting it published. And uh, eventually the MIT Press published it. It became a prestigious uh, book as it ought to have been. Strauss came to St. John's in order to close to Yasha. He'd retired from the University of Chicago, and uh, he, uh, he wanted to be with Yasha toward the end of his life, and that's exactly what happened. He was very often in the Klein house, and I was there every day, practically. So I got to know him uh, in that human setting very well. He was the soul of courtesy. He was so courteous that I eventually concluded that he didn't think too much of women, <laughs> if you see what I mean. I don't know if he had an official position. He did give a, a course of lectures. I think people were absolutely delighted you know, that, uh, that they had him on campus. The stars is immense learning is what attracted students. And almost everything he said was interested and unexpected. He never said anything banal. Uh, there was always something that showed that things were more subtle and more interesting than the student had imagined. I think they loved that, and why wouldn't one? There were people, colleagues of mine, grown-ups, who could not utter 
a paragraph in which Strauss didn't occur. I'm sure that from Strauss's point of view, it wasn't a clique. These were people who he thought he, uh, whom he thought he could really teach something. From the outsider's point of view, they were uh, a group, uh, a very devoted group. They were the butt of a lot of jokes on account of that. And when you heard that bell, <laughs> you just had to grin. You know? <laughs> it wasn't a joke that was told. It was a joke that was telling itself. You know? But I think within the group, there was nothing wrong about it. Often these cliques around a leader have something about it that one can't really go for, that that's wrong. Too much devotion, uh, being uh, under, too much under the influence. These were all serious people who thought about things and found, thought they'd found a teacher. So uh, while some of us laughed, I don't think it was ever really disrespectful laughter. Both of them really loved American students, uh, though I think Strauss was more attracted to the older ones, to the graduate students, and Klein to the undergraduates. I don't know how Strauss felt about the Americanism of the students. But I know that what Yesha liked about them was that they were so utterly ignorant. And that's a very good beginning for thinking. There were a number of students who sort of hung around, particularly in the early days before I was on the scene. Uh, and he felt he felt affection toward them. But I think they never succeeded in being a clique. He didn't go for that. And then, of course, they were personally utterly different. I mean, uh, Yesha was a Russian, and he had all the warmth and the bullions and uh, sort of sensuality of a Russian. But Strauss had, to my mind, something German about him. He was modest and quiet. It's hard to imagine him as the dean of this college, for instance. And Yasha, of course, was a dean, I think, for nine years. Yeah. They had certain fundamentals in common uh, that made them friends, uh, th that formed the intellectual friendship. And then, of course, they were, they'd known each other for ages. I mean, they had a very similar a fate. They were both German Jews who had to leave. Well, Yesha was a Russian Jew, but he'd lived in Germany for quite a, a long time. And uh, so aside from the long uh, personal engagement, they were both convinced that a really engaged reading of the ancient text was the absolutely necessary beginning to understanding modernity and our own lives, and that these texts were much more subtle than uh, the classicists who usually dealt with them knew. So they had that way of reading and that way of understanding the importance of the ancients to modernity in common. I was dean for the seven years uh, in the middle of the, of the 90s. Uh, Mr. Adler is the only human being who is actually officially a lecturer at the college, which entitled us to have him lecture once a year, entitled him to be the lecturer once a year. He uh, would phone me imperiously and tell me, when he was coming. It might be that I already had a lecture. <laughs> that didn't matter to him. Anyhow, I made, I freed the time and we received him. Uh, these lectures were always great occasions for the students. Uh, they were always attended by a, the so-called Adlerpark. One of them was that 
they bought pounds and pounds of marble. You know our auditorium, right? It's got no rugs on the floor. They released them, and it's got down sloping floor. They released them in the back seats, and the marble start trickling down and making sounds like mice. Adler was unfazed. Eventually, he must have noticed what was going on. And as I remembered, he said to them, have you all lost your marbles? <laughs> it was wonderful. The most glorious of them was the final one. He had told us that he was too old to come anymore and that this would be the last one. Here's what they did. Do you know the painting called the School of Athens, Raphael's paintings? Well, there is Aristotle pointing down, and Plato pointing up, right in the middle. They made a replica of that, I mean, a, a live replica on the stage behind the curtain, right? He was lecturing. At a certain moment, the curtain was drawn, and there was the School of Athens with live people, except that Aristotle's figure was missing. And a student came and took Adler and led him into that place. It was wonderful. The, the other thing about Adler was the question period. <laughs> the student would ask a question. Adler would say, the question you really wanted to ask me is, <laughs> he'd then formulate the question to which he had the answer. <laughs> that was Adler's idea of a question period. He was, he was absolutely terminally irritating and terminally charming, both at once. Two ways of being engaged with the ancients that I can think of. One, and they, they're sort of opposite to each other, but both of them I think hold. One is the notion that we are really their descendants, that our terms are mostly Latin and Greek terms for the thinking life, yeah. um, that uh, our science and our politics are descended from the Greek science and politics and the Roman continuation thereof. And therefore, uh, if one has any notion that beginnings are very important to understanding middle and ends, then it makes sense. The other one is just the opposite, which is that there was a great breach of tradition in the 15th, 16th, 17th century in old, early modernity, the, and that in order to understand what is specifically modern about our modernity, one really has to understand what it is that was abruptly left behind. What was left behind was a kind of immediacy, a, a way of seeing things uh, not through theory, not through an inherited vocabulary, but to see it very naively, ordinarily, and therefore very, I think, probably truly. The great example I can give you is the word edos, to us, it's translated form, and it's a technical term. But eidos really means shape, aspect, look. And when Socrates used that word, it kept its naive immediacy. And he was saying that there's something about things of thought that is like a look, and that's the beginning of a certain kind of philosophy. So um, that, from that point of view, to know the ancients is really to understand the moderns. The original ideas, the way I've understood it is that it was as a resistance to the historicism of the universities. By historicism, I mean the notion that everything is to be explained in terms of the social setting and the history that goes into them. 
and that they wanted a college in which, which was not devoted to secondary literature, where, uh, which was commentary on books that the students never got near to, and which was not historicist in a sense of uh, trying to understand uh, all things in terms of their history, but rather to attempt to understand them in terms of their nature and their being. In the beginning, there were still many vestiges of ordinary university life. There was uh, the division uh, of studies into subjects. There was a lot of lecturing going on. My own sense is that the college has become slowly and slowly more and more radical in such a way that now we don't we try to keep ourselves from lecturing the students at all, except on Friday nights. And uh, we, uh, we're less like an ordinary university than I think we were at the beginning, which is an interesting development. It's not the way usually things tend you know, to regress to the old ways. I don't think we've gone that way. It's an interesting question whether Jacob Klein refounded the college from Barr and Buchanan's original uh, notion. I, I always thought that it was a refounding, but uh, the older uh, colleagues who are now all dead uh, thought that Barr and Buchanan uh, had uh, an original idea that was simply developed. So there are two, one can have two views of that. I read the Iliad first, because it was assigned first in, in Brooklyn. And I was not totally enchanted. It's not, it's, it's a truly great work of art, but it, there's something in me to which all this killing Deeply, that's an appeal. One way to put it is that it's not a women's book. Then came the Odyssey, and that's my book, and Odysseus is my man. Without knowing that this was actually a method, I discovered something about Homer that turns out to be, I think, central to read Homer, namely that it's necessary to use your visual imagination, that some things that happen there are indicated visually, but not always articulated verbally. And uh, that's, uh, and I did that sort of instinctively. Later on, I learned that one could actually use it as a, as a way of reading. When Homer describes the spear thrust that Achilles delivers to Hector, Homer doesn't at that moment say anything. But if you use your visual imagination and your memory, you will see that the person that is visible, whom he thrusts it into, is Patroclus, because Hector is wearing Patroclus' armor. And Patroclus' armor, in turn, is Achilles' own, because he's lent it to Patroclus. So he's, Achilles himself is committing two terrible deeds, suicide and the killing of his, uh, of his own best friend. Uh, and then you begin to look through the text and you see that actually the uh, text in a very subtle way indicates that that's what's meant. Over the years, it occurred to me that there was much to be said about the imagination. And a large part of that comes not from the poets, but from particularly uh, Platonic dialogues, and most particularly the Sophist, which raises the question um, what an image is, and gives the answer that in an image you, you're presented with something which both, both is and is not what it's said to be. And the example I always use is if you, you know, someone pulls out their wallet and says, 
that's my baby boy. Uh, you can say, no, it isn't. It's not going to be a very welcome thing to say, but it won't be false on the one hand. On the other hand, that's exactly who it is, his baby boy. It seems to me that if you live in a world of technical terminology, secondariness, uh, sophistication, the tendency is for that to suppress the imagination because everything becomes wordage, verbiage, articulation, and the relation of thinking to visualizing tends to get lost. The first question that anyone who is thinking either of reforming or just of governing has to ask, what are the unintended consequences? There is no way to discover unintended consequences except by imagining them, because they don't yet exist. So you have to form a picture and ask yourself, how will this look if I impose these rules, for example, or if I make these changes? It seems to me that a politics that is governed by manifestos, by uh, regulations, by moral statements, is very dangerous. You need a politics that's governed by visions. Not vision, but visions. So I would say that it's the most important relation imaginable. To prevent decay at St. John's is a question that preoccupies me a great deal. One thing that I can say for sure, it's to think that we're always on the brink, always on the cusp. And particularly, I think in this particular decade, the school is in a very good internal position. Things are going very well. People are, are mostly happy with their classes. They worry a little about conversation because students are out of the habit of conversing. But they learn, they get into it. So we're doing well internally. It's particularly when things are going well that one ought to ask oneself the question, how do I avoid the slippery slope? And it's also, particularly when things are going well, that outside forces tend to want to interfere. So eternal vigilance is the first answer. In other words, you always have to feel uneasy. If, if you think we are all right, you're in danger. This is the end of my 68th year. But when I first came, I didn't have any plans about my whole life. Year by year, I got deeper into it. Year by year, there were opportunities to leave. I never felt any desire to leave. I did sort of play hooky for um, uh, several times. I, you know, I went away, taught elsewhere for a year or two. Uh, those were nice interludes. But neither of these gave me the slightest desire to leave there's never been any question. And eventually it became a whole life. 